I am Daunis Sowers uh, from the University of Latvia, and for the sex next 60 minutes, I will be moderating this, uh, the first panel discussion of the Riga conference. And I do mean the next 60 minutes. I somewhat disgraced myself last year by allowing my panel to overrun uh, uh, the 60 minutes. And there are few more terrifying sights in the world than the uh, chairman of uh, LATO, the organizing committee, standing behind a camera and making this sign at you to uh, uh, finish, uh, because several ministers of defense are waiting to go for their panel. So I will be sticking to the 60 minutes that we have on our clock here. Um, the 21st century has seen an acceleration in the European Union's global ambitions. The entry into force of the Lisbon Treaty in 2009 was a key moment and was followed by the establishment of the European External Action Service, which recently celebrated its 10-year anniversary, and other notable institutional reforms and policy developments. However, as the title of our panel, What is Still Holding Europe Back from Becoming a Global Actor? As the title of the panel suggests, the European Union, which has a, a population of 450 million people and has two member states, Germany and France, that jointly spend around 60% more on defense than Russia, the EU is still perceived as not fulfilling its potential. And indeed, uh, a column, a Charlemagne column in The Economist magazine in 2020 wrote that the EU has the trappings of a foreign policy, but not the actual tools. Foreign policy is a botched Kevin Costner project. They built it, but nobody came. So this panel has two main aims. First, we want to look to the past, as well as the present, to identify the factors holding back the EU's foreign policy ambitions. Second, we want to look to the future and consider what is to be done. And we have an extremely distinguished panel with us both here in Riga and uh, across Europe to address these issues. So uh, Federica Mogherini has served as both Italy's youngest minister for foreign affairs and the European Union's high representative for foreign affairs and security policy. Um, since September 2020, she's been rector of the College of Europe. Dr. Weidewitje Freiberger had a distinguished career in academia in Canada before returning to Latvia and twice being elected Latvia's president between 1999 and 2007. Dr. Marian Meyer has had a distinguished career hopping between the worlds of academia and research as a senior research fellow at both the Center for European and North Atlantic Affairs in Globsec and government, uh, where he is currently the Deputy Minister of Defense of the Slovak Republic. And finally, Mark Leonard is a co-founder and director of the European Council on Foreign Relations, the first pan-European think tank, and is the author of several thoughtful books. Uh, I would particularly recommend What China Thinks, and also a, a podcast he hosts, Mark Leonard's World in 30 Minutes. It really is the world in 30 minutes. So now, um, because all our panelists have extensive professional experience shaping and executing European Union uh, foreign and security policy. In the first round of uh, questions, I would ask them to draw on these experiences and identify the factors holding back the EU from punching its weight on the global stage. And I'll start with uh, Ms. Mogherini, who until quite recently was the European Union's foreign policy chief. Um, and this was an era that spanned the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action deal with Iran, the launch of the EU's global strategy for foreign and security policy, the setting up of the European Defense Fund, as well as rising tensions with Russia, Brexit, and a rocky period in transatlantic relations. Drawing on your time at the heart of power, uh, Ms. Mogherini, um, there are few better placed people to answer the first question of our panel. What, if anything, is holding Europe back from becoming a global actor. And so I hand over to you now. 
Well, first of all, thank you very much for uh, inviting. It's a pleasure for me to uh, join the Riga conference again. Uh, I remember uh, having participated for the first time uh, still in my capacity, I think, as a member of the Italian Parliament, the Defence Committee. Uh, uh, and it's a pleasure to join you, even if, uh, unfortunately, only virtually. Uh, hopefully, in the coming years, uh, I'll, I'll come back in person again. Um, actually, I was reflecting a lot on the title of, uh, of our panel today uh, before joining, and uh, uh, my sincere answer would be nothing. Nothing holds us back. I think. And I am not uh, uh, representing anybody uh, anymore, so I don't have any official duty to express official positions. Uh, this is sincerely what I believe. I think that if there is uh, anything that holds us back uh, is our, uh, at times, uh, actually often, uh, our attitude to underestimate our power and our weight in the world. I think that sometimes Europeans um, understand less or believe less uh, in our global role than uh, uh, our partners or interlocutors uh, that are far from being partners uh, all across the globe. Uh, I give you just one example uh, to be short because uh, uh, I'm also interested in hearing the others uh, um, points of view and I, I submit to the commitment to the 60 minutes. Um, if you imagine taking away uh, for 24 hours all the uh, external actions, all the foreign policy and security policy activities from trade to development, so to humanitarian, to missions and operations around the world, um, multilateral negotiations, take away for 24 hours all external actions of the European Union across the world and see what happens from climate to conflict. I have the impression that that would be a wake up call, especially probably for Europeans to realize that many situations around the world and including many that are very close to us uh, in terms of uh, geography, but also in terms of interests, uh, would collapse, simply collapse. We give it for granted. Uh, but, the, but the European Union action in the world uh, is, uh, is much uh, deeper and much more relevant than sometimes we realize. Um, I think I'll stop it here because uh, I imagine that you want to make several rounds. Uh, but uh, uh, again, um, this is something I probably said several times when I was in office. And it's one of those things, of many things I was saying, not because I was in office uh, and it was written in my briefings, but because I really believe in this. Uh, the European Union is a global player. Sometimes we repeat ourselves that we are not, um, but we are. And I, I think what holds us back is sometimes the lack of recognition of power and responsibility. And uh, I would just ask a quick follow-up here. I mean, are, are you suggesting that the European Union already punches at its own weight, uh, as the phrase says, that there is little area for improvement? Well, there's always area for improvement. Uh, uh, everybody, uh, all players in the world, uh, from uh, international organizations to um, raising powers or already firm powers, uh, already have margins for improving or expanding their role globally, uh, always. Uh, but I say, what I say is that um, I think that this doesn't mean that we are not playing our role today. Uh, I think we are playing the European Union is playing its role uh, in the world. There is space for improvement. Uh, I think that we have to be cautious about what kind of interest we have uh, in expanding our role in the world and in which direction, being selective on which are the priorities on which we can invest more. Um, and for sure, this can be a very interesting discussion. But I think, uh, I think we, uh, we, we are unfair to ourselves uh, if we continue to... Um, to, to describe the European Union as uh, somehow uh, a, a potential that has not come to, to, to reality. Uh, because I think that actually in the, last, uh, uh, in the last 10 years, I believe that the European Union has developed um, a power in the world. And especially, I have, you, you remember, you mentioned the bumpy moments that we, we experienced during my mandate during the Juncker Commission. Uh, indeed, uh, we were put to a test on quite some fronts, uh, east, west, south. Just the Arctic was relatively quiet, but the rest was relatively okay, relatively stormy. And I think that even if it was always difficult, always, uh, um, always struggling to get to a common position for sure, and I imagine we will discuss about the qualified majority voting option, it was difficult, but we always came to a common position, we always came to a common action, 
again, uh, not always this common action and this common position became uh, an element of a solution of the crisis. Many crises and many conflicts were not solved and are still not solved. But this doesn't mean that uh, uh, the European Union didn't play its role. Actually, in many cases, uh, it was thanks to the European Union, and it is still thanks to the European Union, if some processes are still alive, if some agreements are still alive, think of the Paris Climate Change Agreement, think of the nuclear deal with Iran, think of the many trade agreements that we have concluded around the world in times where uh, protectionism was raising again. Uh, think of the uh, EU-NATO uh, partnership uh, that uh, has put in place so many uh, concrete projects for uh, helping and supporting NATO to develop in Europe. Uh, think of the uh, PESCO projects and the capability gaps that we can address through that. The list of things that have been put in place, I think, is, is sometimes underestimated. Again, has this, con has this contributed to solve or improve the situation in the world? I believe yes. Many different fields. Again, so much that if you would take that away, uh, you would definitely notice difference in negative terms. Has this, con has this solved all the problems in the world? No. But has the US foreign policy solved all the problems in the world? Has, ha have the United Nations solved all the problems in the world? Is there anyone that has solved problems in the world? Probably and unfortunately not. But this doesn't mean that we have not become uh, a global player. Again, always uh, margins for improvement with a clear mind. And I hope that the strategic compass that is uh, now being finalized uh, under the leadership of uh, Borrell uh, will help identify the strategic directions in which further investment can be done in developing and strengthening further the uh, European foreign and security policy uh, and defense one. But I believe that uh, um, saying uh, or hinting at the fact that the European Union is not a global player, I think uh, is simply out of touch with reality. And no one around out there in, inside Europe, this can be a position that many could have. But uh, at least in my experience, in my still in my contacts with uh, um, friends and colleagues in the world, nobody would doubt that the European Union is a global player out there. Okay. Apart from Thank our enemies, but this is, this is part of the narrative. Thank you, Ms. Mogherini. Now I, I jump across the river here in uh, Latvia. Uh, to visit Madam uh, President. So, uh, uh, Dr. Freiberger, do you agree with this uh, upbeat, uh, positive assessment of the state of European Union uh, foreign policy? Um, I think your microphone is turned off, uh, Madam President. Sorry, Mr. Yes. Chairman. Uh, I think back to the, to the various stages uh, of European uh, policy formation uh, since my repatriation over 20 years uh, ago from, from Canada. And I have seen a tremendous growth, and I think this is what Madame Mogherini, uh, by the time she arrived uh, on the scene, uh, there had been made uh, really, I thought, tremendous progress from the Europe I arrived back in uh, and the one she took over as our uh, representative abroad. Uh, but uh, the European External Action Service is only 10 years old. Uh, in a sweep of history, uh, that's nothing. In other words, what is lacking in Europe and preventing it to be punching at its level of weight is a lack of awareness of belonging to a European community that is, uh, if you like, a notch above their identification with their national and regional identity. And as we heard our Prime Minister earlier say that there's no contradiction between uh, wishing to strengthen NATO and wishing to strengthen European defense, so there is absolutely no uh, contradiction between being identified as a patriotic Italian, Estonian or Latvian, uh, and a patriotic uh, if, uh, of course, these words are going out of fashion, I don't know what else to find as, as a uh, designation for the feeling of belonging and of being identified with this larger entity, Europe. What is Europe? Uh, we, we talk of Europe, but then we must realize that the European Union 
is a particular construction within Europe and not Britain and not Norway and not Switzerland are part of it. Uh, so that uh, we must be, first of all, specific. But uh, I think for simplicity's sake, yes, I think we can say that EU, uh, we will call ourselves Europeans and the others will call whatever they wish to call themselves. And it is a patchwork, a patchwork of strengths, of achievements, of potential, of impact in the world, uh, which if you sum it up together, as we did in, uh, in, the, in the group between 2007 and 2009 on the, the group on the future of Europe, and we discovered that by doing a summation, uh, were it only for the uh, gold medals won at the Olympics, Europe had this fantastic weight, but nobody ever presented it in such a sense. Uh, uh, I was present uh, in the Netherlands just before uh, the Netherlands um, said no to the veto to the European Constitution. I was uh, sitting there on the same platform with Giscard d'Estaing, who, who was, was the initiator and the main author of, of this drafting. Uh, uh, the, uh, Queen Beatrix was there in person to try and, and, and Prime Minister Balkenende to try and convince the Dutch population that really this would be for the common good for us to have a constitution. But curiously enough, both France and, 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 and the Netherlands did not agree to, uh, to this constitution and therefore Europe did not because there were feelings of things that we could not identify with one reason or another. The uh, External Action Service, when it was created, I, I remember, uh, I think, I think it was uh, President Gonzalez from a, from a reflection group and I, we went uh, and Jorn Olila uh, as vice presidents to visit the first president uh, of the uh, European Council uh, and, and also visit the first uh, external action representative after the Lisbon Treaty came into effect. And uh, we were told that they had no offices, they had no staff. Uh, I remember when I regularly went to Brussels, uh, going by this building that was being built for the Future Action Service. That, and, and there you had symbolically, you look at it and you see the foundations were not even laid yet. They were destroying the old buildings and knocking them down next to the hotel where I was saying. And then slowly it was built up. Uh, to sum up, Europe is uh, a project that is still not completed. Uh, it started way back as, as a, well, an adumbration of what it would be in the future. I think that Schumann and Monet had a very clear idea where they were going. They also realized the, the obstacles that they had to face. And they, they did it as the French say, à la diagonale, you know, they, they approached it sort of very, very cautiously as experienced politicians. They said, let's, let's start on some, with something concrete, very concrete, visibly beneficial to both sides, in this case, Germany and France, um, uh, and, uh, and make, make a common effort of what used to be for the last three wars, uh, one of the reasons for killing each other massively by the millions, decimating the male populations of these countries. Uh, that was a fantastic leap of faith into the future of Europe. But the subsequent steps, just think of it. We here in Eastern Europe, our countries were under communist rule behind an iron curtain, in our case, until 1991. 1991 uh, is, <laughs> of course, for younger people, that's uh, already reading the history, but for people my age, it's very vivid in our memories as a drastic, an absolutely drastic change in what, in this divided Europe, uh, cut in two, but simply cut in two. And I saw actually uh, at the frontier between uh, the Czechoslovakia and, and neighboring countries, uh, the barbed wires, the, 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 the towers, the dogs, the, the, uh, everything. As, as I came once from an international conference on, on the brain functions from, from Prague to, to Paris, 
uh, that that Europe, thank God and thank heavens, is no longer what we are facing. But it had to be integrated. It had to be built up so that this patchwork. You have the patchwork of history. You have the patchwork uh, of geography uh, working against a, a unified sense of Europe. But on the other hand, uh, I think the structures have been put in place. The ones that Madame Magherini was, was, was pointing out and in which she was, she was the second, I believe, our external representative. Well, that's, that's very new. What can you expect from a newly created uh, uh, sort of uh, administrative function. I think they did heroic efforts <laughs> in terms of actually setting this thing going. So that what I see as a challenge for Europe is to get politicians and citizens equally accepting and understanding what it ha means to have a hierarchy of identifications and of loyalties and of commitments and of futures that are not in contradiction but are that where we create synergies where together we are stronger than some of the parts and where we have we are already accomplishing the european union members are already the biggest donors of international aid in the world, but it, that's not really the way it is presented. We have separate countries give, giving, making separate donations and so on. The European Union has its own projects in addition to that. And um, it's, uh, it's still a patchwork. I think it's the summation, the integration uh, of uh, European efforts as an EU uh, process uh, that is going on, it is continuing. There are still countries in the Western Balkans that are knocking at the door. Um, this process will involve, I think, young people traveling across Europe with the Erasmus and other programs who are, in my mind, that are essential uh, to, to create a European identity. Uh, they are being advanced by projects such as uh, European film industry. They are being advanced by having a European um, prize in literature, uh, where literary works from, from different countries in, in Europe uh, are uh, being uh, evaluated for, for just, uh, I think, nearly, <laughs> nearly 15 years ago, I, I p participated in a French initiative that started out with the first uh, European literary prize and I, I was part of the jury. And, and we, uh, we deplored the fact at the time that the evaluation of many good authors uh, was hampered by the lack of translations. Nowadays, we have much more access to the literature uh, written in the various languages uh, of the European Union. And that sort of consciousness, that sort of ability to sympathize, to empathize, to identify oneself as having the same interests as a European with one's neighbors, as well as those far away. The Canary Islands are very far away, but I follow every day what is happening on the island and what is happening with the volcano, because I somehow feel that is part of Europe and that is also of concern to me way up here in the Northeast uh, of, uh, of the European Union. So that I, I don't think Europe has reached its full potential, uh, potential and full, full, full uh, power in the world. Uh, it, it has separate countries that have fantastic power. And as I say, their addition together in one sort of punch uh, would be much more powerful than it is now. But the process is going on. Um, um, God willing, it will continue. Uh, uh, but I, I wouldn't guess as to the date on which we, we would really be uh, considered by, by worldwide, um, say, by, by the journalists uh, of America or of China or of Australia uh, as being a superpower in the world. We, we have a bit of work to do for that. Thank you, Madam President. And so um, I think our first two speakers on the panel are very optimistic, and they've emphasized that it's about perceptions, but in actual fact, uh, uh, the foreign policy is working much better, it's much more effective, 
than generally the public uh, uh, thinks. Uh, what's the view from Slovakia? I think it's, uh, mm, this discussion is a matter of uh, perception and maybe expectations. Uh, we, I, I completely agree with uh, Madam President and uh, Ms. Mogherini that uh, we shouldn't blame ourselves and we sh shouldn't beat ourselves that we are not doing enough. Uh, but at the same time, we should think about, uh, and uh, maybe that will be another round, of uh, your question, what, uh, what should be done uh, in another way or, or what could be done uh, more. Uh, the perception, uh, uh, when, I, when I was saying that a uh, uh, matter of expectations, uh, maybe we are expecting uh, from, I don't know, the expert public uh, uh, media and, uh, and um, some people who are involved, uh, we are expecting too much uh, from European Union. Uh, but uh, European Union is not the same. It's not the unanimous uh, actor. Uh, that's, that's reality. So it means that uh, without more political cohesion, uh, it's uh, very hard to expect uh, that it will be more cohesion on individual uh, issues, uh, including uh, foreign policy and, and, and security policy. So, so it means that... Uh, we, we, we cannot expect uh, that uh, we'll, uh, we'll do the same as uh, United States, for example, or uh, not comparing with, uh, I don't know, China or, or, or these countries. So, uh, so uh, within the framework, uh, which is possible, I think that framework is exploited uh, quite, quite much, uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, we are doing what we can actually, uh, what we can actually do. On the other side, it's, it's, um, uh, it's true that uh, maybe it's, uh, it's, uh, there's a lack of uh, political will in some uh, particular uh, things. Uh, speaking about, uh, for example, uh, my portfolio, I'm not happy that uh, bad groups have been not deployed in 15 uh, or, or how many years uh, since they have been created. We had uh, so many uh, chances, so many opportunities, uh, and we didn't do that. So, so on the other hand, we could, can uh, do more, and we should do more. Uh, yes, it's a matter of uh, perception uh, and, uh, and uh, some differences uh, between, uh, between uh, capitals, of course. Uh, but uh, this kind of uh, decision making and, uh, and uh, maybe internal structures, uh, it's a little bit complicated. and. Uh, it uh, uh, takes us uh, away from uh, more uh, and more rapid uh, action. So, uh, so uh, generally speaking, uh, I, I, I wouldn't say that uh, uh, European Union is not a global actor. It is, as, as it was uh, said uh, on numerous uh, cases. Uh, but on the other side, we, uh, we can be and we should be uh, more visible and more active. But uh, that's a question whether we, we want to be uh, more active. With uh, strong populism around the world, uh, and uh, including Europe, uh, uh, anti-European uh, positions and narratives uh, from many political parties which are very strong in, uh, in the European Union, uh, I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, so keen to, uh, to expect that uh, uh, there will be too much change uh, in upcoming uh, future because uh, I don't uh, see appetite for more political cohesion uh, and, 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 and uh, something like a new Maastricht uh, Treaty and, and creating uh, something uh, much stronger than uh, what we have. We'll be happy to keep those countries which are already in the European Union inside no, because they are strong, uh, strong, uh, uh, sentiments uh, for, uh, for uh, maybe leaving the uh, European Union in some uh, particular countries. Uh, so, so that's why I, I, I would be, uh, I, I think that we should be realistic. Uh, we should find uh, and we should discuss uh, the things, uh, uh, what, uh, what, uh, uh, what we can do more, uh, but, uh, but at the same time, uh, there is no space for blaming ourselves, and, uh, and uh, uh, this is also the message uh, for those who are writing about the European Union and, uh, and uh, these issues, or, or commanding uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, sometimes uh, some kind of uh, confidence in, in, into ourselves uh, should, be, should be more uh, emphasized uh, in these, uh, in these uh, messages. Okay, thank you. Um, you raised some interesting issues there about uh, being a lack of interest um, among mem member states to, to toughen up the mechanisms of uh, the uh, common foreign and, and security policy, or indeed uh, a new treaty arrangement. But 
For now, we're going to go to Mr. Leonard. Um, and I'm going to start with a question you've probably been asked many times in recent years, but I've never asked it, so uh, I'll go ahead with it. Um, so a decade and a half ago, you pub published a splendid book entitled Why Europe Will Run the 21st Century. Do you still believe that Europe will run the 21st century? Thank you very much. So I'm, I'm here in Brussels um, in the Bellemont building, um, looking out um, at uh, uh, all of the, the different people who are trying to, to help Europe run the 21st century and to, to, to survive um, uh, as, a, as a global player. And I, I agree very much with the other speakers that we are on a, a journey um, and uh, it's an incremental process. Rome is not built in a day. But at the same time, uh, I do sometimes feel that we are uh, trying to climb up a, a, an escalator that's going down. And the escalator has been speeded up over the last few years. Um, you know, I think Europe is a real global player in some areas. But I don't think that we do ourselves any favors if we uh, pretend that everything is, uh, is, is going really well, because there is a, a huge gap between the potential which the European Union could have to be an actor on the world stage and the reality um, of how we're seen in many parts of the world. And your question at the beginning was, what is holding us back? And I think there are two things, you know, briefly that you know one is the world <laughs> and the other is ourselves um when it comes to the world the eu was built on a very simple idea which my book why you're all around the 21st century celebrated which was the idea that binding nations and peoples together creates peace it makes war unthinkable and by building a, a community uh, around coal and the coal and steel that we use to build weapons the eu managed to turn enemies into friends uh, and after the end of the Cold War, Europeans hoped that by opening borders, promoting trade, travel, the internet, that they could uh, spread these same lessons to the rest of the world. And that, in a way, was what my book was trying to celebrate, the idea of, of creating a different notion of, of how the world could be organized to that, which has defined geopolitics for the last few centuries. But, um, and I still believe passionately in that vision, but it would be dishonest to say that the world had followed that uh, that vision over the last decade and a half. Um, and I think that the world that we're living in is, is, is shifting quite far away from that dream. On the one hand, we're seeing a, a turn from multilateralism to great power competition, uh, particularly the competition between China and the US. But on the other hand, and this is the, the biggest challenge which, which the European Union faces from, from the world, is that because China and America are terrified of having a war with each other, a nuclear war, what they're increasingly doing is um, competing by manipulating the very things that link them together. And geopolitics has become a bit like a loveless marriage where the couple can't stand each other's company, but are unable to get divorced. And as with an unhappy couple, it's all the good things that brought us together in the good times that we're using to, to harm each other in the bad times. In a marriage that goes wrong, it's about who gets custody of the kids, who gets the holiday home, the pets. But in geopolitics, what we're seeing is that all of the different ties that bind us together, whether it's trade, whether it's infrastructure, the internet, technology, or even solutions to to global problems like the pandemic and climate change, which are being turned into, into weapons. And uh, that is leading to a completely different um, notion to, to those, that which Europeans kind of believed in. We thought that building interdependence would create peace, would eliminate conflict. And what we're now seeing is that um, it is interdependence which makes many people feel vulnerable and which is uh, leading to uh, a state of, of, of perpetual conflict between different parts of the world. That's quite a profound shift which we have to, to get our heads around and which we need to reorganize ourselves on. And that, that brings me to the second problem, which is ourselves. And I think that while the world has been changing dramatically, 
we have not been changing uh, as quickly as before. Um, you know, it's taken a long time to implement a lot of the, the things that we tried to do over a period of time. We had a sort of two decades of, of trying to integrate Europe and to liberalize it by creating the Euro enlargement, et cetera. And now we've had a decade and a half of disintegration and of dealing with a lot of the design flaws in, 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 in integration. Um, and uh, though people talk about a geopolitical commission, about strategic autonomy, strategic sovereignty, there isn't yet uh, a kind of habit of thinking strategically and of putting the enormous assets, whether it's our trade, our economic power, our competition policy in the service of, of geopolitical uh, goals. Um, and, you know, we're a long way from having a euro that can allow us to be free from uh, economic coercion from, from other players. We're a long way from, from building a European pillar in NATO that can make us a proper partner to the, to the United States of America. Or we're able to act on our own if the US isn't interested. Um, but also we organize our, thing, uh, our, our institutions and our power in a way that fragments them not just between member states, but actually uh, we still operate as if there is an iron curtain between the economy and, and geopolitics. And that's very different from the way that the United States of America or China or other powers act. Um, I think that we're making baby steps towards uh, closing that gap and putting in place some institutions which can allow us to, to think about how we can uh, become more powerful. But uh, going back to your question about Europe in the 21st century, I used to think that um, it was possible for a kind of one power to, to try and shape how the 21st century would be run. Increasingly, I realized that actually the, the big goal for Europeans is to, to survive the 21st century as the sort of Kantian community that we want to be in. And that our goal, instead of trying to convert others and to, to, to be on a sort of global transformative the, uh, mission which we, which, I, which we felt we were on 15 years ago is to try and preserve these these values and these ways of working within our continent and that is more of a kind of project of European exceptionalism that rather than one of, of universalism um, it's still a noble goal but I think that that's what lies behind a lot of this talk about strategic sovereignty and strategic autonomy is a sense that we can't convert the Chinese the Russians the other powers to live in the sort of world of, of, of international law and shared sovereignty that we're trying to build in Europe. So the very least we should try and do is to protect ourselves from um, seeing those values uh, undermined within our continent, either by external action or by the challenge which comes from the fact that a large minority of the European population feels that they've been left behind and is therefore pushing back against interdependence. And um, those two challenges from the outside world and from our own people, I think are, are quite profound. And we're not gonna be able to, to, to face up to them if we don't really recognize them and um, start to put in place uh, some really serious actions which can stop the rot from, from destroying a lot of the beautiful ideas which the European project has stood for for the last few decades. Thank you, Mr. Leonard. Now, time is uh, ticking. I already said at the start, I'm terrified of the organizers and slipping behind uh, schedule. Hmm. We have 16 and a half minutes, and uh, we still have a second issue, the prescriptive part of our discussion, what we should do. And I know Mr. Leonard has been gently whispered into my ear that you have to leave us at uh, uh, 16 o'clock Latvian time sharp. So I'm going to turn to you first and ask, also ask kindly if you could be quite, quite uh, uh, compact in this, uh, in explaining, you know, I mean, basically, take two minutes to tell us what we need to do to tackle the challenges uh, of the 21st century that you said, so we can move beyond perhaps just, just surviving the 21st century and having a, uh, a Europe which leads uh, the 21st century. Um, I'm very sorry about, about this, but um, basically, I think the the Geopolitics in the 21st century is going to be about uh, 
weaponizing globalization. And we believe in a, in a rule-based order in these different areas. So we need to be, have developed the tools to, to defend it. And we also need to, to bring political thinking into these different areas. So when we think about supply chains, we shouldn't be thinking about just in time and about um, uh, minimizing the costs of things, but we should realize that, that um, uh, people might use them to manipulate us, to attack us. So we have to, to have a kind of different approach, which is, uh, allows us to, to build in redundancies, to be more resilient, um, we need to develop the euro so that it can allow us to push back on secondary sanctions by, uh, by other countries that are trying to weaponize the global financial system. We need to invest properly in, uh, in, in European defense and the European pillar of NATO. We need to have the right forums that we can, we can get our heads of state and government to, to, to think and act more, uh, more geopolitically. And we need to, to, to rewire the institutions in Brussels as well so that you can actually insert geopolitics into our trade policy, into our competition policy, into all these other areas. This isn't a new agenda. It's what we were trying to do when we created Federica's uh, uh, job in, uh, in the Lisbon Treaty. Um, but it's been remarkably difficult to, to, to make that beautiful dream into a reality. And I'm not sure that the world is gonna, gonna wait for us uh, to carry on at the pace that we've been working in recent years. So, um, I think we need to, to wake up and, and we do need to, to, to get Team Europe to, to really pull together in a, in a fundamentally different way. And that's very, very difficult with national politics going in the way that it is in, in many of our member states. Okay, thank you. Now, Ms. Mogherini, uh, Mr. Leonard tells us that we need to wake up. Um, he's perhaps less optimistic about the, uh, uh, the state of uh, Europe's global uh, uh, role than you are. Um, how would you respond uh, uh, to what he said? Uh, uh, would, would you agree with these comments? And again, if you could keep it nice and short, around two, two minutes. I promise two minutes. Um, I, I, I might surprise you, but I'm actually probably uh, even less optimistic than he is uh, when it comes to the possibility for us to lead the foreign policy or the globalization of the, or the geopolitics of the 21st century. I think that if we want to succeed in our expectations, we have to get our expectations right. And uh, um, I, I was asking myself, do we really want to lead this century geopolitics? Is this for us? I think that we have to be uh, realistic uh, on, on what we need to do and what we can do. Um, and I think that the world of today is a world that uh, cannot actually be led by one single force globally, uh, far from being us. Uh, on top of this, but I think that also the United States cannot lead the geopolitics of this uh, of this century alone, and, and neither can, can anybody else. So I think that if we set up our expectations, our goals right, I think that what we can do is, uh, and again here I'm, I'm probably less optimistic than Mark, is probably uh, contribute to to avoid the worst developments to happen. Uh, in, in this trends that we see happening in the world. Uh, it's a weaponization of globalization, as, as Mark rightly mentioned. It's uh, uh, increasing tensions and, and uh, uh, conflictuality and competition uh, worldwide uh, and regionally, within regions and across regions and among regions. Uh, and it's an escalation uh, of uh, uh, all uh, different trends that we Europeans have tried to contain or actually dismantle with our own uh, institutional build-up. Uh, Madam President mentioned very wisely uh, the fact that we, we started a long journey 70 years ago. Some of us joined us uh, when, well, when I was in high school. I perfectly remember 91. It's really recent history. Uh, and, and, and we made a miracle in Europe. Uh, we made a miracle um, overcoming fights and wars of, uh, of thousands of years. Uh, and uh, bring in democracy and economic and social developments uh, uh, almost in the entire continent. Uh, and still the work is not completed because we, we still have, uh, as, uh, as Madam President mentioned very rightly, uh, we still have the Western Balkans to, to integrate in our union. And, um, and I hope we'll do this as soon as possible. So we managed to, to, uh, to go in the cooperative way in our continent uh, because we learned the lessons, uh, the many lessons we had to learn. And I think that uh, today we recognize and we see that the, the world trends are not the same as the ones we have been investing in in the last 70 years. 
uh, the world trends are not so cooperative ones, are, are, are rather the opposite. And I believe our aim, our goal, and our mission in these times can be that of liaising and networking with all the like-minded uh, partners we have around the world on different topics and avoid the world to go in a wrong direction in our view, uh, to, to go conflictual, to go to, go to, a, to a renewed Cold War or even worse towards a, a conflictual uh, scenario. Um, I think that this is something we can do. We can succeed in avoiding the wars. Um, can we succeed in leading the century? That might maybe a little bit too much as a geopolitical ambition for now, not because of our shortcomings, but because of the reality of the world today. We are a multipolar world. No one in the world can lead alone. Okay, thank you so much. And uh, Madam uh, President, you emphasized several times in, in your first intervention that the European Union project is not completed. But at least in, in terms of thinking about how to enhance the global role of the European Union, what do you think are the you know, two or three steps which should be taken as soon as possible in order for us to, to, to achieve this uh, aim? And again, I'd be grateful if we could fit into a, a couple of minutes. Decisions uh, about uh, both uh, policy within the boundaries of the European Union and outside of it uh, are taken by heads of state and government. Heads of state and government in democratic countries uh, sometimes have a, a very short shelf life. Uh, they, they change uh, as the populations change their minds about which parties are most popular. And this is the, the advantage of democracy, and it's also uh, a weakness. Uh, democracy is a fragile flower. We have to keep tending it. We have to keep watching it and defending it. And one way uh, of doing that is, is to ensure that extreme, extreme positions, uh, those advocating hate towards others, advocating violence, advocating, advocating uh, suspicion, paranoid suspicion of not just governments, but everybody around except you and me, and I'm not sure about you, you see, I'm only sure about myself. Uh, these can undermine uh, the democratic process, and never mind uh, any kind of broader uh, uh, convergence uh, of positions. We see across Europe, both the extreme right and the extreme left of a political spectrum are being, in my understanding, uh, being used uh, as, uh, as instruments of hybrid uh, warfare on the part of countries or, or regions. Uh, it's, it's difficult always to identify just exactly who the authors are, but of entities, shall we say, who are not happy with the idea of a strong Europe who are not happy with a whole region, uh, most of a continent, that is absolutely devoted uh, to the ideas of uh, multiple polarity, uh, rule of law, civil rights, etc., etc. They are not happy because they do not want to practice, nor do they like uh, Europe preaching it. They don't even like Europe living it. Never mind, we, even if we give up our idea of preaching to the world, which we, which we easily do, but we do wish to keep it for ourselves. And this is where we really have to watch. The, uh, the role of the uh, modern uh, social platforms and media creates echo chambers, which, first of all, uh, sort of... Um, uh, I think hypnotize their followers into certain ideas uh, and then amplify, they serve as amplifiers and the silent majority, the majority of citizens who actually are, are reasonably rational, uh, as rational as, as the average person can be uh, and committed to democracy are, are being sort of pushed into the background by the loud, amplified voices by, by the media uh, uh, and, and the electronic echo chambers and bots and uh, everything else. And I think that we will have to be, I think, uh, both artificial intelligence, but also uh, social media uh, will have to be really seriously 
uh, I think, uh, understood, better understood and studied and practiced uh, yeah, because I, I see the slippery slope uh, opening up here for extreme ideas. Europe had them in the 1930s and look at where it led it to, you see. Then it sort of woke up after the brutal bloodletting and now it seems to be slipping back into the sort of things we saw, um, uh, extreme right and extreme left, as, as we saw in the 1930s. And that is something we really should not allow to happen. Thank you. Dr. Meyer, you hold an executive position, the Deputy Minister for uh, Defence. What would you like to be seen done to, to, to uh, toughen or, or to tighten up uh, Europe's global role? Uh, <clears throat> first of all, uh, as I said, we need to keep uh, pro-European parties uh, in the governments. Uh, of course, it's a, it's a, <clears throat> uh, uh, I'm not saying that uh, uh, so much seriously, but uh, but this is uh, this is uh, uh, the answer. You, you 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 need to have uh, the strong support uh, from the uh, capitals, otherwise uh, the European idea uh, will disappear. Uh, on the on the more pragmatic uh, uh, view. Uh, I would say that uh, there are some, uh, some potential tools uh, which uh, could be used. Uh, now, uh, uh, there is a strategic compass, uh, the, the document uh, which should be a strategic uh, document uh, for upcoming period is discussed. And, uh, and uh, what I heard uh, so far, and I've been in Brussels uh, discussing with EU representatives uh, last week, is very promising. Uh, uh, I think uh, we we know what uh, wh where is the problem, what uh, what to uh, what uh, where to focus uh, our attention. Uh, we know that uh, EU needs to adapt uh, to the new uh, reality, uh, completely different than it used to be uh, 10, 15 years ago. Uh, and there are also some procedural uh, maybe uh, tools which uh, can be discussed. Uh, I'm not saying uh, they need to be changed, but uh, for example. Uh, to, to have a unanimous uh, voting in, uh, in the security and defense, so maybe that is a question whether uh, the change in this, uh, in this field uh, shouldn't, be, uh, shouldn't be good uh, uh, towards more rapid uh, action when I was mentioning, for example, European uh, battle groups. So I think uh, that uh, we, we need to find, uh, we need to uh, precisely define the tools uh, which uh, should be helpful uh, in, in rapid reaction, because this is what, what uh, we are blaming for, uh, that uh, we are not uh, visible enough uh, sometimes, uh, we are not uh, active enough, uh, we are not rapid enough. Uh, example of Afghanistan evacuation, although it was not a European actually uh, operation, European Union was invisible. Uh, it was uh, only a responsibility of uh, national, uh, national, uh, national states uh, there. So, uh, so there, uh, those are uh, maybe good examples where the European Union should be more active and, uh, and we should be discussing potential tools within the framework we have, the political framework we have, uh, to, to, to make it uh, more, uh, more credible uh, or to, to make it more active and uh, on the... On the uh, following uh, side, uh, more credible. Thank you, Dr. Meyer. Now, we have time for one quick question, and this is a, a, we've had some questions come in, but there's one question which I think can be answered reasonably quickly, and which was directed at Mrs. Mogherini. And the question asks, uh, Mrs. Mogherini mentioned that the EU had a southern, northern, and eastern, western test, uh, meaning the economic and migration crisis and Ukraine in 2014. Uh, did the EU pass this test? Uh, that's, uh, it's difficult to say a yes or a no. I think that, uh, well, we passed the test. Uh, uh, that was also an internal test because uh, during those five years we had indeed uh, uh, war on Ukraine, uh, war in the south uh, and in Syria and in Libya, uh, the refugee crisis, uh, uh, the change in administration in the United States, uh, rise in China, but also the Brexit referendum. So we also had an internal test. We succeeded in the terms that we survived and the union uh, uh, that I would like to remind us all in uh, summer 2016, many were saying would have collapsed completely. Uh, you remember that after the Brexit referendum, many were saying that this would have been the beginning of the end that, that many other countries would have followed the same way. 
Uh, instead, here we are, I think, stronger than we were in 2016. So, yes, we have succeeded the test internally uh, as the European Union. We have not managed to uh, solve the crisis that we have had around us. We have managed to keep good relations with the United States uh, uh, during the changes of administrations, which was not to be given for granted at certain moments. Uh, and it was something that for me was always a priority to keep the transatlantic partnership strong, even in times of difficulty. Uh, we didn't manage to solve uh, um, completely or to solve the situation in, in Ukraine, for instance, or, or in Libya or in Syria, but uh, if it was not for the European Union, the situation in, uh, in Ukraine, for instance, uh, and you know this very well in, in Riga, uh, would have uh, deteriorated much more than it has been the case. Uh, and all the support package that we put in place uh, to support the reforms uh, in the country have been literally vital for, for Ukraine itself. Um, the same goes with Libya or Syria. But we invested in the resilience of, of societies and, and um, institutions uh, wherever we could, which was, I believe, uh, a way of uh, succeeding the test. So we didn't uh, succeed with uh, 10 out of 10, but I would say with uh, 7.5 out of 10 as a mark, uh, I, I would say we, we have. Yes. Seven and a half. Well, on the Latvian grading system, that's halfway between good and very good. So it's a, it, it's a pretty good, good, yeah. good score, I think. Um, thank you uh, to all the panelists. Uh, our time has run out. We started our discussion quite optimistically. Then uh, uh, we were a little bit more pessimistic, as Mark Leonard pointed out, that we just need to survive the 21st century. And then we had some concrete proposals from uh, Dr. Maya and some of our other panelists. So many thanks to uh, uh, Madam President, Dr. Vita Freiberger, to uh, Federica Mogherini, and uh, uh, to uh, Dr. Maya here, and also Mark Leonard, who has already left us. And now, my friends, you have earned your coffee break. Okay.